The birth story I'm going to share with you today is not just a birth story, it's a life story. This is a beautiful story that I heard in a home birth circle years ago. It was actually one of the first pain-free birth stories that I heard, but the, the, the beauty of this story is in so much more than just the birth, and so I'm going to share it with you. It's uh, a story who, that was shared with me by permission from the mom. Her name is Lauren Semple, and she was pregnant. This was about 20 or so years ago when she was 34 years old. She got pregnant. She already had a two-year-old and a four-year-old. She was planning to have a home birth, and the home birth midwife suggested that she get an, a higher level ultrasound to just um, rule out any conditions. And so she had the um, higher level ultrasound that did reveal that there was complications with this baby, um, that she had a heart defect, that her hands were clenched, um, there was inconsistencies in her brain stem, um, and all of these were markers for either trisomy 18 or Down syndrome. So you can imagine this mom is devastated. But she finds this out at the end of her pregnancy, and she she began to say that she felt she just felt absolutely certain that this that her baby was okay. She also knew it was a girl, and they didn't know actually. They they didn't get to do an ultrasound to and have the gender revealed to them. But she felt so strongly that there was something magical about this baby. She she believes that this baby was preparing her for something really big and important. She said her level of intuition about everything increased exponentially during this pregnancy. And so even with the devastating news that her baby has a disability, there was a peace on her in this pregnancy that the baby's going to be okay and that she's preparing my heart for something important. Um, she, and I've heard this from a lot of women in pregnancy, that there's an increased spiritual sensitivity and an increased spiritual awareness um, and so as they did more testing, they found, they wanted to know if it was trisomy 18 or Down syndrome. If it was Down syndrome, then they would have a hospital birth to have a higher likelihood of chance of survival for the baby. If it was trisomy 18, the medical literature um, says that it is, that condition is incompatible with life. And so most babies diagnosed with trisomy 18 do not live. Many of them don't survive the birth. Um, a good percentage of them die within hours or days after being born. They're very small. They have heart defects and respiratory problems. And less than 1% make it to a year. And so it's essentially, at that time, the, the doctors were saying that pretty much a death sentence. And so she believed strongly that if it was trisomy 18, they were going to continue having a home birth so that they could have as much time with the baby as possible before she died. And the testing revealed that she did have um, trisomy 18. The mom said, I'm so glad that we did not get the genetic testing earlier in labor because I would have spent my whole pregnancy worried about the baby. Instead, I got to spend that time learning to trust and be intuitive and communicating and bonding with my baby. And it's, she said it wouldn't have changed our decision either way. We wouldn't have had an abortion. We would have carried on through the pregnancy. When she went into labor with her daughter, the home midwife came and she when it first started, she, she woke up and she had this moment of clarity and she turned to her husband and she said, she will be born alive. She said, there was a knowing in my spirit. I just knew that our baby would be born alive, that we would get to meet her. And it brought her so much joy and excitement. She describes her birth as being a pain-free birth. She said the contractions started and they came very rapidly. It was a fast labor. The entire labor was three hours long from start to finish. She said the contractions would come and then another one would come a minute later. It was actually almost disorienting because it happened so fast. But she said, I said, what did it feel like to not have pain in the labor? And she said, I just trusted my body. I knew it knew what to do. It was like when you're running a marathon, and she was a runner, she said, you push through it. It's hard and it's uncomfortable. It might even hurt, but, but it's not 
pain in that sense. It's hard work, and you're not afraid of hard work. You just push through it, and you do it, and it's super intense, and there was pressure, and it was intense, but it wasn't painful. She trusted her body, and she, she had the baby. The baby came out very quickly. She only pushed a couple times, and when the baby came out, she was born in the quiet of the night, um, they held the baby. The baby was alive. She survived the birth experience and she was, her eyes were open. She was interacting with them. She was very small. I think she was five pounds, seven ounces. And in the candlelight, in their home, in their bed, they held the baby. They sang to the baby. They talked to the baby. They soaked up every moment with their baby. It was a girl. And so they were so overjoyed. Um, at one time, a few minutes after she was born, the baby started to fade. Her breathing be um, became, began to fade away, and Lauren said that she saw the light in her eyes go out, and she started to lose color. And so the midwife, they thought she, they were losing her, that this was it. The midwife suggested, if you want to give her a few breaths of oxygen, you can do that. And they didn't want to have any medical intervention that would take her away from them. But they thought, well, why not give her some oxygen? And so she did mouth to mouth on the baby girl and she perked up again. The light came back in her eyes and she began breathing again. And then she would fade away again and they would give mouth to mouth just a little bit of oxygen. She said it was quiet and it was beautiful. They did this a few times and then she came, the pink returned to her color. She came and was interactive and she her respir her heart her respiratory kicked in and they didn't have to do mouth to mouth resuscitation anymore and so um, they decided to wake up their other kids so they could meet the baby and the they had a beautiful family time they all curled up in bed together and they just loved on her and um, sang over her and was were thankful for her and she she, she thinks back about this birth experience and how peaceful it was. And she says, I'm so glad we chose to do it at home because I don't know if we were in the hospital, if she would have survived the birth. If they had to take her away from me, she would have experienced those higher cortisol levels. She might not have survived that environment. And so she um, is so thankful. Also, the baby was allowed to have the cord keep pulsing and she was able to keep her on her chest and have skin to skin contact so that all those bonding hormones were able to flow and the baby was able to receive the oxygen that she needed right on mom's chest. And so they didn't know though at any moment that breathing response could fade, could fail, and she could pass away because they knew that this condition is unlikely for anyone to survive. And so they were just absorbing every minute with her that they could. Eventually they invited family to come meet her and she survived several hours and then hours turned into days. And they took her, they never took her to the NICU, but they did take her to a cardiologist because she had a heart defect. And the cardiologist said, she, she'll probably survive a couple more days. A couple more days later, they brought her back. The cardiologist said, she'll probably survive a few more weeks. A few more weeks went by. She was breastfeeding. She was nursing. She actually latched on despite having a really weak respiratory system. She probably had enough adrenaline in her system from the birth that the baby was able to latch on with the, within the first hour of birth and get some really good colostrum that may have even helped her live and contributed to her health at that time. And so um, the next day, however, she had more struggle breastfeeding and so what ended up happening was she started feeding her, she had to feed the baby through a tube in her nose um, because she, it was that second day, she didn't have the strength to do it, but she knew she could do it. She could nurse. She was strong enough to do it. Um, but so, so she pumped and supplemented, but needed more supplementation. She actually found a woman who had had a stillbirth and she was pumping in order to avoid postpartum depression and their midwife connected them. So she was able to get colostrum for her, um, for her baby that the mother wanted to donate and not throw away. And so I thought that part of the story was beautiful as well, that out of that pain, she was able to donate it and bring life to Lauren's baby. They named her Nora. And so they brought her back to the cardiologist a few weeks later, the cardiologist said, well, she may survive a few more months 
or a year, we don't know. And eventually they stopped making guesses and Nora actually lived um, past her first birthday and she, they had no idea. Moms, they said, we don't know when she's going to, to die, but at that point she was surviving and she had grown and she was a fairly healthy baby. They said she did, they didn't even have to take her to the doctor until she was a year and a half old. And most babies born with trisomy 18 have constant doctor trips, constant respiratory um, illnesses, and many of them have to get heart surgeries. But she was a very healthy baby, and Lauren contributes a lot of that to her being able to, to get that skin-to-skin -skin contact and the colostrum that she needed. Um, she said, if someone had told me um, that my baby would live, and, ha and she did, of course, have multiple uh, disabilities. She was nonverbal and was bound to a wheelchair, but she was not immobile. She could crawl around, and she kind of was able to communicate with facial expressions like a baby, and she said she was always so happy. And she just says, if someone had told me that she would live and have these multiple disabilities, I would have felt disappointed that she would miss out on life. But when every day is an unexpected gift and you don't know when she's going to die, and it could be any day, you appreciate every day and you're thankful for every day because it's a gift. She has um, people that have told her, well, I, I don't know how to do that. I would never know how to raise a child with disabilities. And she said, well, I didn't know how to do it either. When I had my first son, you bring them home from the hospital and you have no idea what you're doing. It's really no different when you have um, a baby with a disability, you bring them home and you learn how to do life differently. And she tells stories of having this baby and you, she would have to put a feeding tube in so the baby could get the milk and then they'd go out and play in the sandbox with the other two babies. And so they just learn to do life differently and they learn to celebrate life and be grateful for life every day. Now, this baby actually lived until she was 15 years old. She super surpassed um, any statistics and all the doctor's expectations. She never had to have heart surgeries. Um, she was bound to a wheelchair. She wasn't able to walk and she was nonverbal for most of her life. Um, but Lauren says that she was so happy. Her greatest strength was her ability to connect with other people. She brought joy to everyone who was around her and everyone loved being around her. She um, they, we would they, her kids would play on the floor with her, they would get in her bed, her bed became like a family area where they would all get in bed and play with her, and she was just so happy. She never had a day in her life that she was frustrated, and being around her was a joy. And so um, she said she was a delight her whole life. Now, when she started getting into her teens, she was struggling with more respiratory conditions. She was getting infections. She was um, having to be hospitalized and put on oxygen. She was on oxygen the last few years of her life. And they knew that her time was coming. They knew her time was coming to an end soon. And so in 2016, when she was 15 years old, she got sick with the flu, even though she'd had the vaccine. And she, they realized she's not gonna make it out this time and that there's going to be, that she just wasn't recovering. She wasn't, even with the oxygen and the, um, the stability of what the, they were doing in the hospital, she was declining and her oxygen levels were going down. And they had the discussion as a family together to bring her home. And so they wanted her to pass in the same way that she was born. So they took her home from the hospital and they all got in bed and her whole family got around her and they just she said we just held her and she was a small girl you know at 15 she was like the size of an an eight-year-old and they just held her and she was fading and she was you know sleepy and they 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 had oxygen for her, and they had morphine to make her more comfortable and so they just had and they had several hours but they knew even as they were leaving the hospital she might not even make it out of the hospital because her oxygen levels had dropped quite rapidly, even as they were making that decision of what to do. And they said, we don't want to keep her alive and prolong her, her just for our sake. We don't want to make her uncomfortable in misery and experience misery just so that we can have a little bit longer with her. But we want her to pass in a peaceful way, the same way she was born. And so they brought her home and the whole family surrounded her. And um, 
She lived for several more hours. It got late into the night and most of the family fell asleep. And then um, Lauren tells this um, story that she has this crystal clear dream. She must have dozed off. Um, but she has this intense dream, or it was actually a vision of birds swooping in and coming, like it blackened the whole sky, and they, it was a whole flock of birds, and they swooped in, and it was like they kind of, um, they took her with them, and she said she knew that these birds were coming in the flock, and they filled the whole background of the sky until the sky was covered with birds, and it was like the same moment of clarity she had when, she, when Nora was born, that she had that crystal clear moment that she knew she'd be born alive. It was that same clarity, and she said it, the birds represented everyone that had gone before her, and that they're coming, and that she's gonna go with them, and that she'll not go alone. And so she looked down at Nora and she was completely asleep and completely still and she thought that she missed it, that she missed her daughter's last breath. And in that moment she took one more breath and, and then went still again. And so she woke her husband and her husband woke up. She, her, she nodded like she took her last breath and then Nora took one more breath and died. They had a natural berry natural, um, they had a home funeral for her and a natural bury, burial. <laughs> they, may, they had a simple wood casket made for her and friends and family came to the home and it, they had crayons and markers and people wrote messages all over her casket. They decorated it inside and out with drawings and little kids wrote letters and drew pictures and teachers wrote notes and they laid her to rest. Um, in this casket, and just as beautiful as her birth was, was as beautiful as her death was. So she, they got to appreciate every moment with her, and her mother says it was hard to be without her. Some people will say, oh, it must have been so hard to raise a child with disabilities, and she says, no, it's, it's actually much harder with her being gone. They so appreciated and valued every moment they got with her. She views her whole life, she said, it's amazing how many people's lives that Nora touched. And so I wanna share this story with you to encourage you. And m maybe some of you are even facing a scary diagnosis with your own pregnancy and you don't know what the outcome will be and you're nervous. And I want to give you that picture, that testimony of what God can do in a life and how he can turn what might be a scary diagnosis or what might seem even like a death sentence that even the medical community says it's, it's a death sentence, it's incompatible with life. And Lauren says that we have to get the word out. It doesn't necessarily mean incompatible with life. If we give these kids a chance, many of them can survive. And so it makes you grateful for life. It makes you grateful for every moment with your kids and it opens your eyes to know that God can take pain and suffering and what might be trauma and turn it into something beautiful. So I hope that encourages you. God bless.